thank you for turning out. I, my name's Jeff Carling. I'm the city arborist in Portland. And I've been fortunate to care for uh, Baxter Woods in Portland for the last 20 years, a little over 20 years. Um, Herb Adams to my left actually uh, was up well before dawn this morning at 6 a.m. I think he did the uh, Baxter Sundial. We, we pumped him up for another. He's going to do a little brief history of Mayor Baxter Woods. And then Jensen Bizzle, uh, director of Baxter State Park, is going to unveil the new sign. And we're going to take, if anybody wants, we'll take a quick walk through the woods and look at some of the highlights. So without that, we'll give Herb a little few minutes to talk about Baxter Woods history. For several reasons. <laughs> you can't avoid the blast of hot air by going any further away. <laughs> yeah. For several reasons, you'd want to remember that you once stood in this field on this day. This was originally a much more wide open field. It went far back into uh, what was the private estate of a man named Francis Ormond Jonathan Smith, a United States congressman uh, who befriended Samuel F. B. Morse, the inventor, as we know, of the telegraph. It was in this field that we're standing in now that Morse, who was staying at the estate of uh, Congressman Smith, first experimented with laying underground telegraph cable off a plow that had an endless spool of soft lead pipe. So you could plow and lay the cable underground at the same time. I regret to say several things about that. Number one, he used horses and Irishmen, my people, to pull the plow. That's the sort of guy he was. And secondly, that <laughs> Congressman Smith turned out to be a big thief who tried to steal the entire uh, idea away from Samuel Morse. But you are standing literally where history was made and laid as well, right here. <laughs> and that, of course, uh, brings us back to the story of, of these woods. Congressman Smith had an enormous home further in. Jeff can show you where we uh, figured out the site. Big glass dome over the library, all of that. A very profligate man who built cheaply. So the house looked grand and did not last, but it was bought by um, James P. Baxter. And in the memory of the father who saved it for Portland, Percival, the son, the governor, who we all know and greatly remember, gave it to the city of Portland in honor of his father. So it is actually Mayor Baxter Woods, preserved in wild state, much like Baxter State Park, unpruned, unimproved, and left wild. Jeff informs me that this and across the street in Evergreen are probably the last parts of uh, Portland that have never really been cut over, as you will see once we go inside. And it is, of course, a great honor to have with us a, a gentleman at the end of the line who you will all recognize, who uh, I regret, yes, right, <laughs> who I regret to say neither Percival nor his father were necessarily fans of in 1912. They were regular Taft Republicans uh, in that year. But nevertheless, you'll be pleased to know that a hundred years ago, um, the gentleman represented at the end of the line came in second in the state of Maine in the presidential election, throwing the state of Maine for the first time in decades into the Democratic column the party that the person at the other end of the line <laughs> uh, represents. So we are literally in the field of history uh, today. And Jeff has uh, greatly honored me by asking if I might uh, quote you a little bit about this place and about what Governor Baxter and his father uh, intended for us. I wish there was a gene for foresightedness that we could breed into us all. The number of people who have had it in the past, we remember today, and yet often lack it in our own thinking for tomorrow. Governor Baxter, who I had the great privilege of knowing when I was a little boy, I was 10, he was 90. My memories are vivid. Uh, I think of him often. <coughs> I wish I could talk to him now. The things that I wish I could have asked him. But because he knew the days like that would be coming, he wrote a great deal about what he intended for us and why places like this are special. And the same struggle he faced is the struggle we face. 
to a world where open space to a lot of people was regarded as empty space, we have to transfer the thinking that open space frequently is very full of something very precious and it's uniquely full but difficult to remember in this world. As the gentleman at the end of the line would tell you, who with a stroke of his pen created many national monuments, which meant parks in uh, that day. The simple word in your day, as I recall, was, I so declare it. And Governor Baxter didn't have that easiness. Um, we should not forget that in uh, the cause that both Mayor Baxter and Governor Baxter spent their lives and their fortunes, it cost them everything. Mayor Baxter lost his last race for mayor of the city on the basis of his dream and design for Baxter Boulevard. Uh, it was considered, as the politicians of the day said, nice posy, but we want practical roads and new schools, and they voted him out. Percival Baxter never could get through the main legislature his plans for a large, what he called the Centennial Park then, uh, in 1920, surrounding the lands of Katahdin and the lands around it, which had been cut over. But the opposition was too great. So in each case, they lost a position for that dream. Governor Baxter, in 1926, ran for uh, United States Senator in the Republican primary and was thumped by the party regular. But it, in both cases, it freed two men who had long lives, great wealth, and ex great determination to do work like this. And that has extended them into our lifetimes. I would uh, want you to know, by way of leading to the, the final comments, that certainly Governor Baxter would not want to be remembered as a saint in a three-piece suit. He uh, had hard edges and they bumped against others, often made him many enemies and many friends. He was a practical politician, but he was a principled man. And in one person and in one single career, it is hard to be both. As he knew, because of the two, he chose the steeper path. And these are the words he wrote in his last address to the legislature in 1925. Both men and women today have unusual opportunities to enter politics and to render service to our state. The danger, however, lies in the desire to hold office rather than to render service. Holding office has spoiled many good people who in order to continue in power have been willing to sacrifice principle and honor, and very few know when and how to retire gracefully. My father's words of wisdom will ever be remembered by me, he often remarked. Every man who stays in politics long enough is sure to die disappointed. Some enter politics expecting to accomplish things worthwhile, only to find their ways blocked and useless. The moment a man displays his independence, he is likely to be confronted by opposition and checked by powerful influences that seek to break him. Health, courage, determination, ability, and principle are all needed if true success is to be attained. Temptations are set before such a man or such a woman and plausible argument offered to abandon the upright course. And if he holds or she holds, out against these influences, the road, instead of being strewn with roses, will be beset with thorns. No one should enter upon that road unless they are able to bear their disappointments cheerfully and gracefully. And even though you may not reach the high position to which you once aspired and may fail to accomplish what you wish you could have done, you should always retain your self-respect and if you do, your influence for good will forever be felt in the community. I, writes Governor Baxter in closing, have earned the respect and confidence of my fellow citizens. And I feel, despite the struggle, I am sufficiently rewarded for my work. I love the state of Maine. I love all its people. And this affection has increased with each year of my service. The hard things that have been said long since have been forgotten. 
and forgiven, and there is no one in Maine toward whom I hold the slightest ill feeling. I am grateful for all that has been done for me by my fellow citizens, grateful that my years as governor have not been marred by public scandal or calamity or civil discord or personal ill health. There is much to be thankful for, yet, these are important words, there is much I would still plan to do for my state. David Starr Jordan says, today is your day and mine. It is the only <coughs> day we have. It is the day in which we play our part. What our part may signify in the great whole, we may not understand, but we are here to play it. And for each of us, now is the time. Percival P. Baxter, Governor of Maine, <laughs> State Capitol, Augusta, signed just as bold as that. Uh -oh. Rather poignant words, wouldn't you say? From well experience, put. from well experience. Ah, yeah. Reminds me of the man in the arena. Ah, very good. Gentlemen, well, you just give us a little brief uh, sign and uh, things going on at Jackson State Park. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. I just want to tell folks that have taken the time to be here that uh, the uh, establishment and the, the continuing link we have with our sister parks in Portland has become very important to us. Uh, we benefit very much greatly from uh, Jeff's diplomatic handling of that, and he's been a great emissary to the park. And be able to connect the park, one of Governor Baxter's premier uh, uh, efforts for the state of Maine, with the other events that have happened and the gifts that the Baxter family have done in the city of Portland is really a, it makes the whole, the whole, it makes the, the connection really good. So we're very happy to be able to participate in making this real connection, a park uh, sign made in Baxter Park, like park signs, to make that physical connection with this place here in Portland. It's been really a pleasure. That's great, thank you. Tremendous. Very nice. Yeah. Nice job. That's great. That is one drive. Some of our signs are really good. Yeah. Thank you. Again, it was the, the Smith estate until I believe the James Finney bought it in the late 1800s. Uh, but you can see but this map from 1935 that you had the Girl Scout area uh, down here, Boy Scout area, and then you had the Campfire Girls over here. And this designed to build a parking lot here where the gatehouse used to be, and then another parking lot over here in Personal Street. So there was definitely some ideas showing the, the network of trails, identifying all the big trees in, in, that were here in 1935, many are still here today, that there was a lot of intent of how to better manage the space and use it for, for students and or to get youth out as education. And Maine Audubon, or Maine Junior Audubon was involved as well. So I'm sure that this field trip really followed the, the message that that they had at the time of getting kids from the city out here into the into the wilderness of Baxter Woods. And this was while it was their private property? Mm -hmm. Back in the 1930s. And so I, I, I imagine from 1935, uh, you know, during the Depression, uh, it was probably knowing seeing those pictures from the Maine Historical Society showing the, uh, the campfire girls with headdresses on and exploring the ponds, that it was probably an important part in a lot of people's lives as far as getting that exposure to open space. And when was it gifted to the state? It was given to the city of Portland city in 1946. Ah. So I, you know, you think about then World War II happened, 1939, 1940s, <clears throat> probably after the war, looking at the way it would be easier to take this gift and give it to the city. When I started in Portland in 1989, uh, someone said, go visit Baxter, Baxter Woods, and I came out, and um, it was pretty much a lot like a vacant lot. Uh, this roadway here, there was no guardrail to keep cars out. And the cars would drive in and cars would drive out and there were tires and old washing machines and things dumped in the, in the middle. And it had been really run down. No one had cared for it for a long time. And we, we thought it was really important to kind of protect it by putting the guardrail up and keep cars out. And then to make it a, make it a place that's inviting. And so by getting more and more students involved, 
uh, caring for it, taking care of the trees, we found that the p people turned around and people started using it more. But people were afraid to use it when it was run down because they were afraid that it didn't look safe. So I think presentation, that's why I think the new sign, the Mayor Baxter Wood sign uh, that Baxter State Park made for us is really a nice addition. I think people will go by and, and recognize the sign. I was really pleased a couple of years ago, I opened up the uh, USA Today, February, it must have been 2009 or 2010, no, 2010. And on the cover of USA Today was Baxter Woods, and it talked about the importance of open space in America. And they somehow randomly, someone had sent them this picture, and it was here in the winter time, but the, the article went on to talk about how important local open spaces are, that people do try to get to the national parks and other places, but sometimes they start with the, the park that's in their community and saying the town forest and places like Baxter Woods are really important. So I was kind of, I sent it around to everybody I know that works with us. Um, so so you really spearheaded this. Absolutely. Main Tree Foundation, uh, Sherry Huber has been great. Uh, Pat Maloney from Project Learning Tree and then of course the Maine Forest Service people. Um, and they all know this park really well. Wow, well congratulations. No, it's Thank great. You. And I think, uh, you know, it's really you know, we've been looking forward to this day for a long time, and I, it's just nice to see it fall together. I really appreciate all the, the visitors, the friends of Baxter State Park, and people like yourself. Well, thank really you. appreciate yeah. it. Oh, it's awesome. Hemlocks in Maine. It could be on the big tree list in Maine, but I don't think we, we have to have it nominated. But uh, the sign in front here, um, and this, is Pat here? Pat Maloney? No. Patrick, Pat Maloney and Project Learning Tree, along with the Maine Forest Service, we get students out here to talk about uh, outdoor forest and environmental education. And we really think that's what Baxter included in his gift to Portland to use it for a municipal forest and for educational purposes. So maybe he was trying to get disciples for the future that would carry that campaign of open space. But, you know, when I, we bring students in here, and Herb did a great job of talking about some of the history. When Herb and I did a story on this in Portland Monthly about 10 years ago, I had just done a tour with the kids from Kosamskit School, and we walked around the loop like we're doing today. And this girl was about 10 years old, and she looked up and said, this is really great. This is the first time I've ever been in a forest. Oh. And I kind of like, because you get take it for granted, anybody who goes out in the woods and, and, and likes forests, but this student, uh, young girl, was just amazed. It was perfect October weather, the leaves had turned gold, and, uh, but she was thrill thrilled to spend the afternoon in the forest. And I thought, you know, I take it for granted sometimes that we take care of these resources, but, you know, I think you all today understand how great these are. So it's going to go a little bit further, we're going to go to the Baxter Monument, and then if anybody has any questions, we can answer those. And, and uh, they must have picked the spot, and I think looking at the grapevine joints in this patio here, uh, the father was from 1946 when they dedicated it. Um, you see some attempts been made to pry this thing off, and we come in, we actually do make sure it's cleaned and taken care of, but it's been pretty successful, no one's been able to pry this off yet. Um, but this is kind of the, other than that plane in the background, for someone living in the city and people that live here in Deering Center neighborhood that frequent the park all the time. You know, this little bit of open space is pretty nice. And um, so I think it goes a long way, similar to what Baxter State Park does, only on a real small scale. Um, so I, you know, I, I think when I look at this brochure and I, and I see this monument, you know, caring for the space is really special and, you know, I, it's great to have visitors that appreciate it. So I'm, I'm really, thank you for coming out today. And, if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to try to answer it. The house that we talked about, the Smith House, was sat right there. What so happened? Herb said it was built on unconventional means. I think it was built cheaply, and oh uh, it fell into disrepair. Uh, those little granite monuments you see around on the, uh, the little benches, those are all pieces of the foundation. Oh. And as we walk out, we're going to go back out this way, we'll see some of the other pieces of granite. Uh, there's also a hierarchy of trails. I mean, there's the main part of the were carriage trails from the old Smith estate that we walked on. But right in this area here, it goes down and it takes a little, there's a little footpath. It's kind of a, just a little path itself. Because most of the park 
has these roadways that you can actually walk down these little paths and, and feel pretty, um, like you're pretty far removed from civilization. It's kind of nice to do on, on a daily basis if you live in the city here.